try it. This is my daddy's show. podcast my name is dj wells i'm holding the trap down dolo today but don't worry we're gonna get y'all taken care of as usual for monday morning or whatever you decide to listen to this wonderful content but first and foremost we gotta pay the bills around this joint we're gonna go ahead and shout out to the sponsors man shout out to sun king brewery greatly appreciate y'all as usual also shout out to hang time indy two locations in the city pull up if you need some summer's about over man so it's your last time getting y'all fists off before them kids go back to school and first and foremost, before we get into the real topics, shout out to these damn kids going back to school. I know these parents who've been working from home, Corona been kicking everybody's ass, especially with the lack of these summer programs. And we love our kids, but at the same time, fuck them kids. Glad y'all made it through the summer. Them babies is going back last week and the last batch is going this week, man. So y'all hold on in there, man, for sure. Also, shout out to the State Fair making this great return. Quarantine and Corona. Took it away from us. I'm so excited that it's back. Everybody can pull up. You know what I'm saying? I know it's a little bit wild. Boys got to keep the mask on to an extent, but shit. We out here anyway, man. But more importantly, with sports this week, we're going to go ahead and start off with the NBA draft. And I'm happy that we got to have the NBA draft in person. Um, for those guys who have sacrificed so much and for those kids who finally have their dreams come true, for them to be able to walk across that stage physically, get the shake up, you know what I'm saying, with Commissioner Silver, throw the hat on. It's a wonderful thing that I feel a lot of people got robbed of. Um, the one thing I felt bad about the corona situation for the young amateurs was for the kids in high school who were going to college who didn't get to do all the, like, visits and shit. Like, fruits of your labor. Like, you deserve to be able to go get wine and dine for your hard work. Like, no McDonald's game, no all-star games. That sucks, man, because a lot of times with these kids, I mean, they build a lot of bonds. If you look at all of these old podcasts, well, not old podcasts, but retired players podcast they speak very fondly of those memories and those connections that they built with those people during those time periods with those circuits because even last year AU was very very scarce um this year everybody acting like that corona shit don't matter no more so they're back in these streets but I'm very happy to see um the draft back live and also the format this year was a lot better the one thing I always hate about the draft is they take the sorrow and they take the despair of other people and turn that shit into tv like, for instance, you'll have a kid who was a one and done that Kentucky played his ass off. You know what the first thing they're going to say? Yeah, he's a great basketball player, but let's talk about when he was four and his fucking mom died. And I'd be like, God damn, it's okay to talk about the journey, and it's okay to acknowledge where these guys came from and how hard they had to get in the situation. And that's one thing I don't like about the casuals and fans is um, we compare a lot of people. That's what our job is, what we do. That's what we like about sports. It's just a part of it. But to get to these particular levels, even just getting drafted, if that kid never plays a fucking single pick and roll, if he never gets a tip off, if he never gets a shot, he made a huge accomplishment that a lot of people cannot do, and that's make it to be a professional in your field. So salute to them for being able to do that. Um, I'm happy we don't have those dumbass sorrow questions. I am really wanting to get away from them doing the family interviews too because if you look at some of these players – Hey, man, these kids are somewhat trained to have these conversations. Hey, man, these parents is out here just overwhelmed, man. And then a lot of times what you get is you got the family members who really happy and in the moment, and then you got them one peoples, a.k.a. them back doors. And them back doors be them people, the AU coach or the handler of these programs, they can't wait to get their ass on TV. That's the one thing I used to laugh so much about John Calipari. John Calipari was at every draft with all his teammates, excuse me, not teammates, all the kids he had going to the draft. And he was like, hey, yo, you see my face? This could be you. This is advertisement. I ain't got to do no recruiting, but you're going to see me on draft day with about four of them things going in the first round. So I'm happy to focus this more on the actual athlete. Um, like I said, the situation is a little bit different. Hopefully they keep this format going forward. Stop banking on people's demise. It's one thing that black people already go through is us selling our trauma. We don't need no more of that at our highest times where we should be honored and getting thanked for and getting acknowledged. Stop selling black trauma. That shit is a joke. We already got to deal with enough that white people don't understand. We don't need to give them more ammunition for them to feel sorry for us. Nah, fuck that sorry shit. If you really care about us, take time to have a conversation with us and know somebody's journey. Uh, ESPN, y'all got to stop doing that shit. 
look, y'all already behind the eight ball when it comes to um, diversity. But we ain't even going to get in that subject. But some notable things happened to the draft, man. Uh, kind of went in a little bit order as I expected. Um, Kay Cunningham being the number one pick, we all knew that a long time ago. And if you didn't, you didn't watch any basketball. He's pretty damn good, man. The Detroit Pistons are still going to be ass. They got a couple young players in um, Bay. You got Jeremy Grant and him. They'll be solid. Um, obviously, they won't make the playoffs. They'll probably be low lottery again. But it's a really, really good building point. And I like the way that Kay Cunningham plays basketball. I'm just be flat out. He's pretty much a 6'8 point guard, really good handle, good feel for the game. Um, once he's able to play away from the ball and once he's able to get a game with his back to the basket, he's going to be a really, really solid NBA player. Unfortunately, he just in Detroit, and them boys are down there boo-boo as hell, and they're going to be back in the lottery. Now, one team that's going to definitely be in the lottery who took the number two pick was the Houston Rockets, and I'm very, very excited to watch this team. This would be one of the teams that if I had to pay for league pass, I would not mind cutting them in because they're not going to win a lot of games in Houston. They have a very inexperienced roster. They still got John Wall down there raping the budget. But they got a young nucleus of Kevin Porter Jr., who I'm a really big fan of. He has to grow up off the court and keep his head out of bullshit. But he is a talented basketball player. Uh, They picked Jalen Green with the number two pick who came out the G League. He was the first guy to go straight from the NBA, not from the NBA, but straight from high school to the NBA G League. Hey, man, I don't know if you guys have seen him play, but he's very, very talented. He's a 6'6", 6'7", wing, very athletic. He has to learn how to shoot a lot better, uh, but you can't teach athleticism. He seems to have a good feel for the game. And on top of that, they got Josh Christopher at the end of the first round. Both of them were high school phenoms. Josh Christopher is from the west side. He comes from really good lineage of basketball players. Um, I've seen him do incredible things in the Drew League. I mean, pick up basketball only goes so far as we know. We've seen some of the bummiest of bums go and pick up games and look like fucking Michael Jordan. So that doesn't really hold a lot of weight. But they're an interesting team, man. They still got Christian Wood, who is an up-and-coming player. Look, man, Houston is an attractive city. And if you can get enough young pieces to be functional, they won't have a hard time getting people to come there, especially once John Wall's contract off the books. Because other than that, the only person they're going to be paying is Christian Wood. I know they're trying to move Eric Gordon as well, but his deal is up soon anyway. So... Houston rebuilding the right way, the young way. I love to see it that way. Um, Typically around the draft, we always have these rumors or transactions for people wanting to move up in the draft and move behind in the draft. Man, we had some crazy situations take place this year. Uh, Russell Westbrook to the Lakers. Now, I'll be completely honest. I didn't see this coming. I know that the Lakers and Kings had had dialogue, and they wanted to move Kuzma, Harrell, and whatever to get Buddy Hill and make the money work. Once the Russell Westbrook play came in, you know, I understand why, but I have mixed feelings on it. I'll go ahead and start with the pros from this. The one thing that the Lakers needed was a creator and somebody else who they could trust with the ball and the clutch to make things easier for LeBron. The whole I'm 36 shit with LeBron is absolutely true. Shout out to O. I know I ridicule LeBron a lot for saying, oh, now all of a sudden your ass went a point guard when you went your whole damn career not using one the proper way. But honestly, he's necessary. I mean, Russell Westbrook is one thing Russell Westbrook going to do. He's going to play his ass off, man. He can always get you double-digit rebounds. He can always get you double-digit assists. Um, I know with the championship team, um, a little bit different because they used Dwight and JaVale McGee. But the one thing that the Lakers team did very well outside of defense was they rebounded the ball very, very well. And that's one thing that you can trust Russell Westbrook will do when he's in the game. And for me, it's not really about him playing alongside LeBron and AD. It's what he's going to contribute to that second unit because Russell Westbrook is a one-man wrecking crew. When he's healthy, like he was the second half of this season, dog, Russ is a problem. Now, he does not help their issue with shooting, like, at all. Like, giving up KCP in that trade, I think, was a little bit like, eh, maybe too much, but it was necessary to make the money work and for them to get another shooter. Um, I know they wanted Buddy Hill, but... I much rather have Russell Westbrook than Buddy Hill. Buddy Hill is a volume shooter on a shitty team. Let me repeat this. Buddy Hill, volume shooter on a shitty team. Now, to respect Buddy Hill, he shot a lot of badass shots. And of those badass shots, he was shooting like 40%. It was something like 4 from 10 for 3 and like really bad rush contested shots. Y'all can look the stats up yourselves. But, I mean, he's no slouch by any means, but I don't think that his contribution to that team will be nearly as much as a Russell Westbrook can give you, especially with the whole narrative of, L, uh, excuse me, Russell Westbrook being an L.A. kid. He going to have them blue jerseys going crazy. 
And if you look at the other additions that they're probably going to make, uh, Carmelo Anthony probably will be a Laker. That's a really good pickup for them, especially for the second unit. Um, DeMar DeRozan rumors I've seen. I don't know if him and Kyle Lowry are really that close on butt buddy stuff to where they're going to go somewhere together. I've seen Miami. Um, I've seen Dallas as a long stretch as a possibility. But I would like to see DeMar DeRozan go to the Lakers. I mean, he's pretty much said he's willing to take a pay cut to make that happen. DeMar DeRozan, Compton, another L.A. kid. The only issue the Lakers are going to have is they are going to have to find shooters because they have the talent. I do think that they need to get Dwight back as well. Um, that's one thing that I think that they fucked up with. Dwight and JaVel McGee should have been priorities for them. Mark Gasol was not the answer because Mark Gasol's IQ is way higher than him in creation-wise. But here's the thing. You don't really need him to be that much of a creator if you have LeBron James because LeBron James is on that point forward shit the whole year. Um, as much as I like uh, Caruso, Caruso is not a playmaker. He just does what he's supposed to do. So I think Russell Westbrook is going to give a lot to this team. Um, the West isn't as strong as everybody likes to say. Kawhi is out all next year, so you can take the Clippers out of the situation. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with the Phoenix Suns. Just a couple hours ago, you know, Chris Paul opted out 44 mil. I imagine he probably will run it back with them, and they'll give him more money just for the fact that he got them to the finals when the year before they were praying for a, a lottery spot or praying for a praying spot. So, you know, a lot of things can happen in the league. And um, another couple things that happened for, I'll speak specifically for the Pacers. The Pacers were rumored to move 13 to a lot of different teams. Um, they picked up a shooting guard out of Oregon who is deemed to be the Dominican Clay Thompson. Now, when the Pacers got to that spot, I'm thinking Moses Moody. They've been high on Moses Moody. They've been all on his dick. I'm like, okay, do what y'all got to do. I'm okay with getting a young wing with upside. Do not take that white boy out of Gonzaga, Corey Kispert. And, man, I had PTSD, goddammit. When I saw that he wasn't off the board and the people that we wanted were still available, I was thinking, Pacers going to pace. We going with a white shooter. We were in about replacing Doug McDermott in the goddamn lottery. And sure enough, they did what the Pacers do, and they took a safe pick. Now, this gentleman, uh, Chris Duarte, I might be fucking his name up, but I'm going to respect it later. Um, he's 24 years old. Um, he came from Dominican Republic, but he played Juco basketball. Didn't start playing basketball until he was 16. So, yeah, he's old as hell, 24, but he's established as a family man, and you know what he's going to give you. That is what the Pacers look for. As much as I love the Pacers, that is the same reason why they will not go far until they are legitimate ready to take legit risks. You know what the one thing that the Pacers did and got lucky was the fact that the Utah Jazz took Gordon Hayward before Paul George. Do I think that Gordon Hayward would have become a great player and probably an all-star with us? Absolutely. Is Paul George a way better player than Gordon Hayward ever has been? Absolutely. Sometimes we can't save ourselves from ourselves. Now, I think this guy is actually going to be able to contribute very soon because, like you said, he's not no young guy. He's 24 years old. He knows the game of basketball. He has some pretty solid shooting numbers at Oregon, but the problem is when you draft, especially in the lottery, you have to take a chance with somebody who could change your franchise. Now, a lot can be said and a lot of things can change. This dude could come out and fucking really be Clay Thompson and I got to shut the hell up. But you have to be able to get talent on your team, grow it, and make sure that talent ain't just some, oh, this guy can get you 15 a game. No, you need to be able to try to evaluate if you can get a potential all-star. I think that Moses Moody is a guy who has upside. He's 19 years old. So you got somebody at 19 who you could develop at 24. He may fuck around being an all-star. Who knows? Or he could be out the league. That's the only thing I hate about the Pacers is that they have to learn how to access talent and how to accept risk. The one thing that Kevin Pritchett hasn't done well is drafting. And I understand that it's not all on Kevin Pritchett. I am aware of that is a collective decision. He does not get the final say. But honestly, he is now playing for his job at this point. So I would think he'll take more risk with the situation. You look back at the Kevin Porter situation. Uh, Kevin Porter worked out for us really, really well. I was hoping we drafted him, but we didn't. Last year when he had his issue in Cleveland, I mean, he was 
basically on his way of being out the league if somebody didn't give him an opportunity. But the one thing about a kid like that is his talent was always there. It was just his headspace. And also, he was a little bit of a victim of his environment. So you needed to get a kid like that and tuck him away. You look at the situation that happened with Lance Stevenson in Indianapolis. I mean, nobody wants to babysit their assets. But when you have talent and you have possibilities, sometimes you have to go that extra mile. You can't be known as that franchise that's all vanilla and clean cut because those franchises don't do shit. They don't progress. They just stay in the same place, and that's probably why the Pacers haven't done shit in the playoffs since Paul George. Now, on the fair side of these things, if you look at the way the teams are constructed, for instance, go ahead and look at the Bucks because typically most teams try to model after the last year's champion. You won't get another Giannis. There's no way you can build to get another Giannis. But if you look at the way that team was constructed – Hey, man, they only had two people on their team who could really shoot, if you want to be completely honest. That was Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez. And that's the reason why I think that Russell Westbrook makeup, oh, excuse me, not makeup, pickup for the Lakers isn't going to be that detrimental to them without shooting. Yes, they're going to need it for spacing, but they can make it work. When you've got talented players who can do whatever they want to do when they do it, it don't really matter what you can't do. It's about what they can't stop you from doing. So if they can get some shooters, um, I've seen Otto Porter Jr. who might be on the vet minimum people will take less money to go play with that Lakers team. And I think that the way that they could play basketball and if Anthony Davis keeps wanting to be a goddamn two-guard in his mind, hey, Anthony, go ahead and shoot all these damn twos. You're just going to stretch the floor for us. You just got to commit to playing the five. I think it could work, man. I think that the way that Milwaukee played and dominated through these postseason, I ain't going to say dominate because they barely skated by some series. But on those times where they were locked in and they needed to go win those games, they dominated. I mean, Chris Middleton played his ass off, but Giannis destroyed. And if you look at the way the other teams are made up, it's possible to replicate that. Shooting is very important. It's almost the most important thing in the NBA. But more importantly, getting easy baskets in the playoffs is the most important thing ever. And if you can get to the foul line consistently or you can get to the rack consistently, it's going to be very hard for a team to beat you. Now, moving on to another team that tried to make a move around the draft, but lost their goddamn mind, the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, they are actively trying to move Ben Simmons for the King's ransom, and they are all acting like we did not watch Ben Simmons play in last year's playoffs. Like, we watched Ben Simmons not take a layup and pass the ball out. We watched Ben Simmons score four points in the entire series of a fourth quarter in those series. Um, I don't know who supplies them with their narcotics, but I would like their individual young man or woman's number because they are clearly high off that shit. Elton Brand is up there smoking that Tuka pack thinking he about to get four pick swaps and two first-round picks for Ben Simmons. Now, I say this very respectfully because I think Ben Simmons is going to go to another situation and he'll be back on his All-Star status. To be honest, Ben Simmons is playing out of position. Shout out to my boy Phil Collins. He's been saying this for a very long time. I got to give him credit where it's due. Ben Simmons is not a point guard. Ben Simmons is somebody big who can handle the basketball. And if somehow, some way, he gets to a team with a coach that knows what the fuck he's talking about, and I mean that because Doc Rivers, hey, man, sometimes Doc Rivers be having all this talent and don't be knowing a goddamn thing to do with it. And if it wasn't for the fact that he had veterans and Kevin Garnett, who was a psychopath, and Paul Pierce and Ray Allen and the young, great Ray John Rondo, we would be questioning some of his decisions a little bit different. That championship ring be holding Doc over and Doc been wilding for a very long time, but we ain't going to talk about that today. I think Ben Simmons can go to a team, and he can contribute on a major level. I think he's learned a lot, too, man. And one thing that people have to understand, man, Ben Simmons checked out during the playoffs, and we're going to ridicule him for it. But it's like everybody. When you go to work, and everybody complaining, and your homeboy got PTO, and you got to cover his slack, hey, man, ain't nobody trying to be there. Ain't nobody trying to deal with that shit. Your boss, a.k.a. your coach, talking shit in the press conference, man, fuck you. I don't want to be here with y'all no more. I don't hear you saying none of this bullshit to be. But at the same time, Ben Simmons did not do what he was accustomed to doing. He can go to a team right now and really, really help that team. I don't know how it would happen. I would love for him to be a pacer. I mean, that's wishful thinking. But if you look at some of the possibilities, um, Portland, I think that he would really help Dame. I don't think that that team is going anywhere. Of course, they'll make the playoffs if Dame stays. But if somehow, some way, it was centered around a C.J. McCollum and some other picks, because to be completely honest, um, Ben Simmons has all the leverage. If they ever decide to come out and says, hey, I don't want to come back to fucking Philadelphia, Philly gets absolutely nothing for him. They will have to do 
with the same shit that happened with James Harden leaving the Rockets. They're going to make it wait a while, but at some point they're going to realize they're going to get what they're going to get. And one thing about trading superstars and one thing about trading all-stars, you never fully recoup back in those situations. You just get what you can get going forward. Now, to be fair, there are enough dumbass teams in the NBA to where somebody should be able to flee somebody. We've seen dumber things happen beforehand. So I would love to see where Ben Simmons goes. Like I said, I don't think that there will be a lot of crazy free agent signings that happen in um, what, about 28 hours, 24 hours, something like that. You'll see a lot of teams doing a lot of swap just to get a lot of tools to retool up, or honestly, to plan for the future. If you don't have a plan to be higher than a 4-5 or five seed, you have no business really caring about making the playoffs. Go get you a young talent. I'll say it like this, how I envision the NBA. You'll have a lot of teams who are very, very top-heavy in these conferences, and those will be the contenders. Let the young talent be in these small market cities develop so then they can make space to get some veterans and make them competitive teams. That's the one thing I like about seeing with Memphis is Ja Morant, is built a culture there of, hey, you can come play with this guy and not feel bad. Or I don't know how it works now because you got a new coach in New Orleans, but Zion Williamson, you can go get guys to go play with those guys, and it's okay for them to struggle because they're getting good. And then once they get to that point to where they're perennial all-stars, they can have a squad to compete. The Brooklyn Nets of the world, the Los Angeles Lakers of the world, um, I don't even know if you can say about Boston because nobody gives a shit about Boston no more. I really wonder how long they'll keep Tatum and Brown together, but that's a different conversation. Um, the Clippers are off. The Phoenix Suns could possibly bounce back. Long story short, those teams are very top-heavy, and you'll have people who want to go to those teams who can immediately be in contention, especially with veterans. Let the young talent go places, and I like what Memphis did. Memphis made some moves to get to that top-10 pick, and they got Ja Morant, another young guard, to grow with. That is a successful way to rebuild. Their rebuild was not hard at all, and I hate to reference the Pacers so much, but there is nothing worse than having a team full of players that are okay, good, but not great. At some point, they're going to have to sacrifice this roster. If you ask me, I think moving Miles Turner and Brogdon is a really good decision for them. I don't know what they get in return. Hopefully a young guard. That's what I've been advocating. But if you look at all these teams who are successful, they're drafting right, they're taking risks in the draft, and then they're having cap space open to come get those people who can take them over the top. It's very hard getting a superstar in the draft. We can completely understand that. But if you look at some of these successful teams, they got all these guys through the draft, and they developed them while they were on young deals so they could come give proven veterans guaranteed money and then compete. But going forward, man, my man Kyrie Irving got on these uh, internets talking about Nike, got him fucked up with the Kyrie 8. He ain't fucking with that shit, and he feels sorry that's a part of his brand. Now, I'm going to be completely honest here. Everybody who listens to this podcast knows there is no Kyrie Irving slander allowed on this show. I am biased, and I don't give a shit about it. But I'm going to be completely real in this time. I hope that this situation isn't because of Kobe Bryant. And what I mean by that is Kyrie and Kobe were very, very close. He fucks with the family. I hope that his beef with Nike isn't carried on from the situation with Vanessa. And... Y'all know how I feel about that. Vanessa signed them damn papers. Us regular-ass people would love to acknowledge Kobe and honor Kobe and play in Kobe's as well. But apparently, if you ain't got a bot and you don't play in the NBA, you are not getting a pair of Kobe's. Kyrie Irving, I hope that your beef with Nike is just your beef. I haven't looked up the contract to see what it ends, but he is on his eighth signature model. I can imagine, especially in the last year, Kyrie Irving probably ain't been an easy person to deal with, dog. Like, he ain't fuck with none of the bubble stuff. He's been on the social reform, social justice stuff, and that's not to be slighted because one thing we talk about Kyrie being a head ass and a whole type of stuff, he's always put the money where his mouth is, and he has no problem doing that. So I hope this can be resolved, man. Um, I think having the signature shoe is such a dope thing, and it's sad for people like me who are sneaker enthusiasts. You know, we've seen the decline in signature models, man. You look at, there was a time period, I would say probably about 10 years ago, that you would wear some of those signature models with regular outfits. I mean, Dom Kennedy told us don't wear LeBron to the club. But at that time period, shit, if you want to pull out a South Beach, hey, there wasn't nothing wrong with that. Shout out to the retro. They ain't the same, but I understand. I still fuck with them nonetheless. Hey, man, ain't nobody rocking these LeBrons. Like, LeBron was in Space Jam 2. Well, he made Space Jam 2. Man, we supposed to be thirsty for them Browns. We don't give a shit about them LeBrons. PG started off with one of the best basketball shoes of all time. And past that second model, that shoe has been blah, blah, blah. Kyrie Irving the same way. He's had some hits, but the rest of him have been blah, blah, blah. And not even from a style standpoint, 
from a performance standpoint. And I think that's probably where a lot of his beef is because Kyrie Irving is a quick agile guard who's on his toes a lot. I looked at that mock-up for that shoe. Man, that shit looks like an airship. And if you know what an airship is, you don't want that shit and shouldn't nobody be playing that geriatric-ass Nike. So hopefully that beef is just between Kyrie and Nike. Hopefully it gets resolved because it's one thing that we know. Nike ain't taking no L's, dog. They ain't taking no L's with MJ. They ain't taking no L's with Bron. They ain't taking no L's with Kobe. So if you think that Kyrie Irving going to be the person that takes down Nike, ain't no way in hell, dog. They're going to get him up out of here so fast and change his name to them shoes for the retro so quick. We won't even think about that shit no more. But hopefully that's all resolved, man. Leave Nike alone, Kyrie. You ain't going to never win that fight. Um, we talked about Team USA on this podcast and their lack. I mean, they've been winning, so I got to respect it. But who really gives a shit because this is what y'all supposed to be doing? It's like when your parents be like, I'm not paying you money to do chores because you live here. That's the way you contribute. That's how I feel about Team USA winning. Ooh, you beat Croatia by 40. Good fucking job. We don't care. What I care about is that goddamn Colangelo. Now, he got out here on the Twitter streets, and he talked about how Kevin Love told him that he was ready to play basketball, and Kevin Love got there fat as hell and out of shape, acting like he got hoodwinked or he lied to him. First and foremost, that is one of the most exemplary examples of fucking white privilege. Hey, man, Jerry Colangelo ain't asking none of these black players, hey, you in shape? Cool, pull up. Hell no, nah, they're going to go through a workout, see how you what. Man, Kevin Love showed up fresh off the pizza rolls, fat as hell, not doing nothing. And if you could have guessed, dog, look at what he did in Cleveland this year. Not a goddamn thing when he played, but besides complain. His highlight for the last four years of his career outside of Steph Curry's shot is him throwing the ball out of bounds on his player's back turn. And he just looking like, oh, well, fuck it. Then he was hating on Colin Sexton. Man, fuck Kevin Love. Kevin Love, you had your time. You are fattening out the league. I don't understand who... Who needs to go get Kevin Love? I know he's trying to get another situation. Now, I'll be real. I do not get mad at nobody for mailing it in on Cleveland because Cleveland is ass. Evan Mobley was their pick. He was the number three pick in the draft. I think he has an amazing upside, but please free that man. Don't nobody deserve to go rot in Cleveland, man. You look at Darius Garland, man. Darius Garland is a really good, promising point guard. You look at Colin Sexton, he's the exact same. You know what they're trying to do? Well, Colin Sexton. Bro, they can't really get a, a big enough bike to get that guy out of there and Kyle Sexton can ball. You look at Jordan Clarkson. Jordan Clarkson is sixth man of the year. Played phenomenal basketball the last two years. You know where he was before that? Riding away in Cleveland. Defund the Cleveland Cavaliers. Fuck Jerry Colangelo for trying to put this whole AU black top. That man got on there and tried to make an NBA Street 2 roster. And we got over there and Nigeria said, fuck us and whooped our ass. So if we want Olympic basketball to be taken seriously, go get people who are directly involved with these players. Like everything else we're talking about, things have a date on them. There are no connection. There are no pride. There are no incentives to doing this shit. They don't give a fuck about the dream team. 92, look at these young dudes. Most of the motherfuckers weren't even born in 92. They don't give a shit about no Patrick Ewan. Yeah, we all love Jordan, but that was it. You look at the other teams that were constructed, dog, the Redeem team will whoop the dream team's ass. This isn't a hot take. Just go measure up them rosters and let me know if you feel differently. Because if you do, you probably smoking that shit Udden Brand was smoking on when he was trying to get fucking five pick swaps for fucking Ben Simmons. So hopefully they get this gold, man. Um, one thing I will say is if you can get a fucking map, well not map, excuse me. If you can get a channel site or you can get a channel list to see when Slovenia plays, go check that motherfucker Luka Doncic because he be killing in the NBA, but he goddamn it. LeBron James in the Olympic version for him over there, man, going crazy on boys. And it's set up to where we're probably, as in USA, will meet up with him in the final. And honestly, I'm going to keep it real. I hope he will our ass. I hope that somehow, some way, the gold medal game is USA versus Luka Doncic, and Luka come out here and give us a 40 triple dub and get us off the sticks because these jokes is way more important than that gold medal. We don't give a fuck about them gold medals. We don't even acknowledge them no way. It would make me nothing happier to be able to get out here and disrespect all these people. I don't want to hear Dame Tom. I don't want to hear no Kevin Durant shit. Y'all let Luca get y'all off the sticks. That is what I'm looking forward to. A couple topics we're going to run through before we get up out of here. Uh, speaking of the Olympics, um, Simone Biles, man. Simone Biles, one of the best Olympians of all time. It was weird as fuck to get on social media to see these grown-ass men question her drive or question how good she was. Man, Simone Biles done did more in y'all lives than y'all ever could. 
Yes. You know why she backed out of a competition? Because she was fucking injured. And she also didn't want to further injure herself. She ain't got shit to prove to y'all. It's amazing that these people get on these Twitter sites. And honestly, I'm a victim. Not victim, brother. I'm important. I do the shit, too. I be talking about shit. But I ain't stupid enough to compare. Dog, she's not a quitter. You got people in the NFL talking about, I would have never done that. Or Michael Jordan would have never set on Game 7. Man, shut the fuck up. Michael Jordan played basketball hungover. He played Game 6 over. You think he had a flu game from some pizza? Man, fuck out of here. Mike was turned the hell up. Mike had to step away from the sport. It's a lot of people who did some bullshit. And y'all, they're not compare their resumes to her. She is superior. Shout out to her. If she feels like competing in another one, I would wish the best for her. But if not, you are a legend. Fuck with these weirdos is talking about, and y'all resumes can never fucking compare. Um, the Colts, man. Shout out to the Colts. Fuck y'all. Major injury to Carson Wentz. From the report, shout out to Mike Wells that he'll probably try to, you know, handle this shit at the crib, rehab it through and not have surgery and be ready for week one. Hey, man, if y'all done made this move to make this man y'all franchise quarterback, fuck these first couple of weeks. Carson Wentz needs to have surgery. He needs to have surgery, repair whatever is wrong, take the proper time for him to heal because he's your franchise quarterback. That's the one thing in the NFL I do not understand. Teams will literally kill their quarterback just to split a two and two at the beginning of the season and lose him for the rest because he's hurt or he's fucked up going downhill and then you got to replace him. Dog, Carson Wentz, take your time. You've injury, been injury prone. Get your shit together. Come back strong. The Colts' first four weeks are already hard as shit. You probably weren't going to win a majority of them anyway. You were lucky to split those. Let that man heal. Take your surgery and come back the right way. If not, go call Jacoby Brissett back. Bring that man back. Go get Marcus Mariota if you want to. Anything that would make me happy to see Colts fans in agony on Sunday. Why? Because fuck y'all. Y'all spoiled. And y'all don't know what it's like to have the real struggles of not having a quarterback. Y'all motherfuckers went from Peyton Manning, a little recessed version of Curtis Painter, to Andrew Luck. You are not that blessed to have a goddamn franchise quarterback for fucking 25 years. Now y'all know what it's like to deal with real problems in the fucking NFL. And the NFL, man, they out here trying to tell boys, look, you ain't got to get this vaccine, but if y'all asses ain't ready to play on Sunday, shit, y'all going to forfeit. Now, this is, I feel both sides of this. It's just like, hey, you know what? We're in a situation to where we understand people's beliefs, but we cannot fuck up this bread. We cannot jeopardize this bread because of decisions y'all want to make. Now, legally, they cannot come out and tell boys they got to get that because no employer should tell you what to do outside of work. I repeat, there is no place on earth where no employer should be telling you what the fuck to do outside of work. That is wild, it's unethical, and most importantly, you're out of fucking pocket. However, the issue that they had last year, hey man, we can't be having wide receivers out here playing quarterback. Like that Denver game, they had a third string quarterback from college come out there, get his ass whooped. Man, they would much rather put a 63 game on TV than no game at all. And more importantly, if that shit can't get made up, boys ain't getting paid. So they telling y'all, hey, you ain't got to go get the vaccination. You can live however you want to. But guess what you ain't going to be doing? Jeopardizing these motherfucking TV games. Cause that's what they Look, man, 2021 is a year to re-up. A lot of people lost bread during this pandemic. Not just the regular ass people, all these industries. They got a penny pinch however they can get it back. So I see both sides of it. Um, you know, I don't have much regard for football players after they traded their future and collective bargaining agreement just to not be tested for THC. I feel no sorry for you. Shout out to the homies that play football, man. I know some of y'all are intelligent, but a lot of y'all be that early CTE be getting the best of y'all, man. So we'll see what happens in that particular situation. And last but not least, the baby. Um, I'm not gonna speak on this wrong. Stop looking from smart stuff from dumb people. That's all I gotta say as a whole. Stop looking for smart and intelligent shit from dumb people. And I'm not sitting here saying you should be looking for soliloquies or eloquent things being said. More importantly, stop thinking that dumb people know how to keep their mouth closed. Because if they knew how to keep their mouth closed, they wouldn't be so dumb. And with that being said, we're going to wrap this episode up. Appreciate y'all rocking with the kid. Like, share, subscribe, all of that good shit. We will be back shortly, man. Stay safe out here.